Hello, and welcome to today's webinar hosted jointly by the American Psychiatric Association, the American Society of Addiction Medicine, and the American Academy of Addiction Psychiatry on 42 CFR Part 2, the rules governing the confidentiality of substance use disorder patient records, often referred to simply as Part 2. This webinar is being recorded and will be available shortly on all three organizations' websites. My name is Dr. Karen Drexler, and I am the moderator for today's panel. I serve as the medical director for the American Academy of Addiction Psychiatry, and I am also a member of the American Psychiatric Association and the American Society of Addiction Medicine. Previously, I served as the National Substance Use Disorder Program Director for the Department of Veterans Affairs from 2016 until 2020. The three organizations hosting today's event ASAM, AAAP, and APA recognize the urgent need to share timely information about recent regulatory and legislative changes to Part 2 so that you can begin to adapt these changes into your clinical practice. As many of you know, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration released a final rule on Part 2 that goes into effect on August 14th. This rule will allow for better coordination between care providers for patients with substance use disorders. This increased ability to coordinate care between providers is more important now than ever, as recent data show that the incidence of overdose deaths has increased nationwide, and there is growing concern that these deaths of despair from depression and substance use disorders have been exacerbated by the COVID-19 pandemic. In addition, Congress passed into law on March 27th, the CARES Act, which includes provisions that will change Part 2's enabling statute. These changes are intended to further align 42 CFR Part 2 rules with HIPAA, the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act. Per the law, the regulations required by these legislative changes cannot be promulgated prior to March 27th, 2021. We know that this can cause confusion, so to reiterate, Part 2 regulations just finalized will go into effect on this Friday, and additional regulatory changes required by the CARES Act will be put into effect on or after March 27th next year. We know these changes have sparked many questions on how they impact clinical practice, so I want to get right to our presenters and leave plenty of time for questions. First, we're excited to have with us Deepa Avula, Chief of Staff for the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, to provide some opening remarks about SAMHSA's work on 42 CFR Part 2. Next, Judd DeLoss is an attorney who recently became CEO of the Illinois Association for Behavioral Health. He previously served as the Association's General Counsel for five years. While with the organization, he drafted state legislation that eliminated prior authorization for substance use disorder medication, focused on parity, and more. Throughout his legal career, he has represented behavioral health providers, federally qualified health centers, and physicians. He has also testified before Congress as a subject matter expert on 42 CFR Part 2 given his extensive experience analyzing legal and regulatory issues around Part 2. In today's presentation, he'll provide an overview of the changes to Part 2 law and the changes resulting from the final rule that SAMHSA released. Lastly, Brian, Dr. Brian Hurley, a member of APA, ASAM, and AAAP, is an addiction psychiatrist, an addiction physician, and the director of addiction medicine for the Los Angeles County Department of Health Services. He also serves as a clinical director for the second iteration of the Treating Addiction and Primary Care Safety Net Program funded by the California Healthcare Foundation and directs two grant funded programs managed through the National Health Foundation related to the expansion of addiction treatment services in general medical settings operated by Los Angeles County. He will provide a clinical perspective of how the part two changes will affect a medical practice. Following their presentations, we will have time for questions we know many of you sent questions in advance and appreciate that, but all are encouraged to submit any additional questions in the Q&A box throughout the webinar. With that brief introduction, it is my pleasure to welcome Deepa, who is joining us by phone. 
Deepa, we are having difficulty hearing you. Perhaps you're on mute. Oh, sorry. Thank you very much. I actually got kicked off for some reason and had to dial back in. So thank you all very much. Um, first, I just want to uh, thank APA and AAAP and AFAM for doing this really important uh, webinar. One of, the, one of the great fortunes we have here at SAMHSA is that the head of our agency is an addiction psychiatrist, Dr. Eleanor, Eleanor mccamps Katz. She would have loved to uh, be here today to welcome, welcome you all. But one of the main issues that she uh, really came to SAMHSA to try to address was the administrative administrative burden that 42 CFR Part 2 uh, placed on providers. We already know that the treatment gap for those who need substance use disorder treatment and those who receive it is vast. Basically, it's about 90% of those who need care for their substance use disorder do not get it. And we certainly do not want, as SAMHSA, one of the reasons people don't get care for for their, be, it to be in any way an administrative burden issue or a lack of understanding on the part of providers on what they can and cannot do or the complexity of regulations to treat this population. And we know all of those issues exist uh, with, with any federal, federal regulations. Those are, are things that we grapple with. But one of the things that Dr. McCants katz felt very strongly about is that in order to treat substance use disorders comprehensively, it really does require an all hands on deck approach. It is not enough for just a specialty care system to treat this population. So how, how, how do we do that? One, one of the ways to do that is to ensure that individuals, primary care practitioners, non-part two practitioners, that they have a certain ease in the ability to get information, to share information, to have access to data and information while still protecting the confidentiality um, for the client. So one of the things that we've done is we've made sure that changes that we have proposed in what is now the final rule are really centered around patient consent. You will hear that um, there were um, some concerns about whether or not taking the steps that SAMHSA took would in some way violate the confidentiality or, or privacy of the individual receiving substance use disorder treatment. That is in no way our intention. Really what we want to do and what we have aimed to do with this rule is ensure that an individual with a substance use disorder gets access to as comprehensive and a, 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 a care provision as possible. That simply by virtue of them having a substance use disorder that they are not somehow relegated to less comprehensive care. So that is what we have aimed to do here, that we have aimed to say that we are actually trying to reduce stigma by saying that simply because you have a substance use disorder, uh, you should not have an uninformed practitioner that may be one of your treatment um, providers. As was mentioned earlier on, the CARES Act um, ultimately brings 42 CFR Part 2 and HIPAA together. SAMHSA could not do that on its own. We needed statutory action for that to happen. We are pleased to see that Congress uh, took that step time-wise. As you heard just now, that step was taken in March, and we were given a full year to implement, to really kind of realize the, the goal of that law. During that year, we did not want to lose the progress that was made from this rule. So SAMHSA, the, the department, the administration, SAMHSA, collectively decided that we were going to still move forward with this rule, recognizing that it wasn't as far as Congress is, has asked us to go. Rather than pulling the rule, we, we decided to fully implement it. And the reason we decided to do that, because it is so important again, to lift as many barriers as possible, to ensure that people get high quality care, to ensure that there isn't discrimination to, for benefit eligibility, for example, for people with substance use disorders, to ensure that practitioners do not have to take extra steps on their personal devices should they have incidental communication. You'll hear about all of these details throughout the webinar, but the reason that, because again, we've gotten some questions why did you elect to do this during this year? The reason we elected to do this is because we do want to get closer to a place where individuals are receiving comprehensive care, where practitioner burden is less, and where individuals with substance use disorder are not discriminated against because of their substance use disorder. So again, I thank um, APA and AAAP and ASAM for hosting this webinar.
want to also let you know that SAMHSA has available to you at no cost. Um, it's Privacy Technical Assistance Center. That's at coephi.org, coephi.org. There are available resources to you. Um, we are also doing webinars and other things through that resource. But again, the importance of this particular webinar cannot be um, overstated. So thank you all for inviting me to participate today. And we stand ready to assist you in, in, in implementing this new rule. Thanks very much. Thank you, Deepa, and thank you so much to SAMHSA for your efforts and the important work that you do at SAMHSA. Next, we have Judd DeLoss. Thank you, um, and uh, good afternoon to those of you uh, listening in the uh, east and, and central regions of the U.S. Uh, today, I wanted to uh, discuss uh, the CARES Act modifications to uh, the statutory uh, enabling statute for 42 CFR Part 2, and that is 42 United States Code 290 DD-2. Not to get too technical, but the as, as uh, Ms. Avula uh, mentioned, uh, the changes to Part 2 to align it more closely with HIPAA required a change to the statute, uh, which, which uh, uh, was the uh, uh, the, the, uh, the, the action taken by Congress in order to carry out that, that change. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so the, uh, the, the CARES Act, as many of you are aware, which dealt with coronavirus, uh, was signed March 27, 2020, and it amended the statutory basis for Part 2. Again, the goal being to align uh, Part 2 more closely with uh, HIPAA. Uh, HIPAA, generally speaking, uh, does not require a consent for many uses and disclosures of health information, uh, except in unique circumstances. In the uh, realm of SUD uh, treatment uh, and referral for treatment, uh, generally a consent is necessary for disclosure of SUD substance use disorder records. Uh, so the, the new uh, statutory change, and again, the regulatory changes have not been released and would not be effective as uh, Dr. Drexler uh, mentioned until next year, uh, will allow for disclosure of covered records for treatment, payment, and healthcare operations. And those are the general uses and disclosures of health information that are permitted under uh, HIPAA. Uh, so the, again, the alignment here is an attempt to align more closely with HIPAA. The, the statute was modified uh, to a large extent, but it still does require a consent uh, before disclosure may take place. So in order for a Part 2 program, uh, Part 2 program is an entity or an individual that carries out substance use treatment, referral for treatment, uh, and holds itself out as, as doing so, and is also federally assisted, meaning that it does receive uh, funding either for, through some government program. Uh, it has obtained uh, its uh, DEA uh, 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 prevent, uh, the ability to prescribe uh, controlled substances under the DEA uh, and or uh, the, uh, the nonprofit tax status recognized by the Internal Revenue Service are examples of federal assistance. In those circumstances, Part 2 programs may now share information with the consent, one consent, with other Part 2 programs, HIPAA covered entities, which are healthcare providers that engage in electronic transactions, uh, health plans and healthcare clearinghouses, as well as with business associates. And those are the vendors and uh, service providers to covered entities under HIPAA. After that disclosure takes place, further redisclosures may take place in accordance with HIPAA. Uh, so the initial disclosure takes place with consent. It can only be to one of the three entities I just described, and it can only be for treatment payment or healthcare operations purposes. After it is released to one of those three entities, it may be redisclosed in compliance and in accordance with HIPAA. So there is the ability for further disclosure without additional consent to take place. Uh, just generally speaking, there's also a provision under the CARES Act which will allow for uh, de-identified SUD records to be shared with public health authorities, uh, which is an interesting uh, nuance or take on de-identified information. Uh, under HIPAA, if protected health information is truly de-identified, uh, it is no longer protected health information and may be shared or used or disclosed uh, virtually without any type of restriction, except under 
other state or federal law. Uh, the, the prohibition on use of SUD records is uh, beefed up and uh, they are not uh, a, a accessible or usable in civil, criminal, legislative, or administrative proceedings other than by a valid court order, and part two has a court order process, or by patient consent. Um, there are, uh, in the past, uh, fines and penalties under part two were uh, by virtue of, of a criminal prosecution. Uh, the statute adopts the HIPAA fines and penalties uh, and, and makes that uh, much more stringent. Uh, there is an additional uh, requirement now for those part two programs that are not HIPAA covered entities, they may now, uh, must now uh, comply with the HIP, HIPAA breach notification requirements. And then finally, there is a broad new, brand new uh, prohibition against discrimination uh, based upon inadvertent or accidental or an intentional disclosure of SCD records. Next slide, please. Uh, we talked about the amendment to the statute and the regulations that will come out not to be effective until uh, prior to uh, March 2021. Next slide, please. Uh, in terms of the disclosure, as I described, there's only disclosure under these under the new uh, statutory changes for treatment, payment, and certain healthcare operations, uh, and then only to other Part Two programs, covered entities, or business associates. Once those recipients, other than the Part Two programs, receive that information, they may then redisclose pursuant to the HIPAA uh, provisions. Uh, there is an accounting of disclosures requirement uh, under the HIPAA High Tech Act. Uh, there is a requirement that HIPAA uh, covered entities provide an accounting of disclosures that are made for a wide variety of uses and disclosures to third parties. Upon request, the patient may uh, obtain a, a listing or an accounting uh, every six years for free. Uh, in this case, the High Tech Act provisions that require disclosure for purposes of treatment, payment, healthcare operations are now applicable to Part 2 programs and to those that receive uh, the records pursuant to this, uh, these new provisions, uh, which is not what HIPAA currently requires. So HIPAA does not require an accounting for treatment, payment, and healthcare operations at this time, even though high tech is the law, the regulations have not been uh, implemented. And then there is a right uh, of the individual to request a restriction on the use or disclosure of their health information by a healthcare provider to a health plan for uh, some treatment or service or item that they have paid for out of pocket. Next slide, please. Uh, the consent process, again, it must be obtained prior to disclosure. Uh, pardon me, uh, part two has a specific consent form at this time. Uh, we believe that will be modified pursuant to the CARES Act uh, amendments. It must be in writing. Uh, and then there is the ability, as I mentioned, to obtain one consent for all future uses or disclosures until revoked. Uh, question in the future will be how will uh, SAMHSA and the, and the new regulations address the impact of revocation and implementing revocation upon downstream, meaning those third parties that have already received the records, if the consent is revoked, does that put an end to further uh, redisclosure of those records? Next slide, please. Uh, there's uh, to be a model notice of privacy practices that's going to be issued uh, not later than one year after the enactment of the, uh, the CARES Act. Uh, which is to implement and incorporate all of these new modifications uh, to ensure that they are adequately explained to patients and individuals, uh, clients, et cetera. Next slide, please. Uh, the breach notification provisions of HIPAA are now incorporated and applied to part two programs. As I mentioned, most healthcare providers are covered by HIPAA uh, if they engage in electronic transactions. Uh, for those part two programs that are not uh, covered entities under HIPAA, they will still now have to comply with the breach notification process. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this is a, a very dense slide uh, for your uh, reference. It essentially summarizes all the HIPAA breach notification requirements, which is to notify the patient within 60 days uh, or without unreasonable delay. Uh, there is a, a, a summary of the, the type of information that must be included. In addition, the provider uh, has to notify HHS within 60 days uh, if there is more 500 or more individuals whose information has been breached or within 60 days of the end of the calendar year for those breaches that are less than uh, 500. In addition, if the uh, 
breach in, involves more than 500 individuals in a state or jurisdiction, notice uh, to the media must be made as well. Next slide, please. There are new anti-discrimination uh, provisions which were not in uh, prior, uh, the prior version of, of part two um, and uh, really addresses some of the issues that uh, part two was, was uh, effectively uh, designed to, to uh, pr protect against. Uh, for example, there, there are now um, prohibitions against discrimination for the admission, access to, or treatment for healthcare. Uh, there was concern that uh, individuals that disclosed they used illegal substances or had an addiction issue uh, would be treated differently in the type and, and level and, and uh, access to healthcare. Uh, that would now be uh, prohibited. Uh, employment, workers' compensation, sale, rental, or continued rental of housing, uh, access to the federal, state, or local courts, any kind of social services or benefits, uh, and then finally, any recipient of federal funds may not discriminate against an individual based upon the Part 2 records in affording access to the services provided by those funds. Next slide, please. Uh, use in legal proceedings, civil, criminal, administrative. Uh, this, this spells out the prohibitions. Again, uh, there is a specific uh, process for obtaining court orders in civil and uh, criminal proceedings under Part 2 requiring notice uh, and a specific process that the court itself must follow in order to issue that order. Uh, this spells out some additional details uh, as it applies to not only civil criminal, but also administrative or legislative uh, types of proceedings. Next slide, please. Penalties enforcement. Again, we have a very uh, dense slide here. Wanted to set forth uh, the details of the HIPAA fines and penalties. As I mentioned before, Part two historically was enforced criminally by the U.S. attorney, uh, and then those penalties that would be uh, implemented or applied to, to violators uh, were under criminal code. Um, and because of that, it was difficult, if not impossible, for uh, enforcement to take place uh, because in order to, to uh, proceed with any type of sanction, fine, penalty, um, imprisonment, there would have to be the establishment of a crime. Uh, so historically, there has not been a great deal, if any, enforcement of Part 2. Uh, now, the, uh, the uh, new Part 2 provisions under the CARES Act uh, incorporate uh, those fines and penalties that are set forth under HIPAA. And here we have a, a listing, uh, a summary of, of the types of uh, uh, violations and the amounts of penalties that would be applied, as well as imprisonment. Uh, for those criminal circumstances. Next slide, please. Uh, at the very end of uh, the, uh, the CARES Act, there was uh, some information inserted that is entitled the Sense of Congress uh, related to how the CARES Act statutory changes should be uh, reviewed or, or considered when putting together the regulations. Uh, so the, the Sense of Congress here is, is set forth in terms of what they would uh, like to see take place with respect to the regulations uh, that SAMHSA promulgates, uh, with obviously with respect to the prescription drug monitoring program, uh, which we'll talk about in a little bit under a separate set of rules, uh, the use for treatment payment and healthcare operations, uh, trying to make reasonable efforts to comply with a patient's request for a restriction, um, there's also a, a unique uh, discussion about the definition of healthcare operations, which is a defined term under HIPAA. Uh, and here Congress is saying that it should not include de-identifying health information or a limited data set or fundraising. Uh, those items should not be included in the healthcare operations that may be carried out under this uh, new scheme. Uh, and then finally, programs creating protected SUD records should receive positive incentives for discussing with their patients the benefits to consenting to share such records. Next slide, please. Uh, again, at the outset, to avoid confusion, what I've been summarizing were those changes that were announced uh, as part of the statutory changes in the CARES Act in March of this year. Uh, more recently, the final rule uh, for 42 CFR Part 2 was published in July uh, of this year and will go into effect, as was stated earlier, on Friday. Uh, these do not include the CARES Act modifications. These were changes that were proposed back in August of 2019. Uh, and as our prior speakers mentioned, uh, in the interest of uh, 
getting uh, further change and further streamlining uh, the process and easing administrative and other burdens upon providers, uh, it was, it was uh, enacted at this time. Next slide, please. So I will provide just a brief summary of the final uh, rule that was issued. This rule, as, as mentioned again, will go into effect this Friday. These will be permanent changes until such time as the CARES Act modifications uh, will, will change them, but they will be uh, uh, the, the regulatory requirements as of Friday uh, until such time as changes are uh, implemented under the CARES Act uh, regulations. Uh, in, in, the, uh, in the new uh, final rule of July this year, uh, it revises the definition of records so that if information uh, is disclosed or shared by a Part 2 program orally with a non-Part 2 provider for treatment purposes, and again, that would require consent, that information does not become a record protected by Part 2 merely because it is reduced to writing or transcribed by the non-Part 2 provider. So if a patient gives consent, Part 2 program talks to a non-Part 2 uh, provider, healthcare provider, that information, if taken down by the non-Part 2 provider, uh, even if it relates to SUD, does not become protected uh, record under Part 2. Uh, in addition, the, the fact that there is information recorded by a non-Part 2 provider that relates to an SUD uh, does not in itself uh, make that medical record subject to Part 2. So if there is um, information that a part, non-Part 2 provider takes down in its record, his or her record, uh, that relates to an SUD, uh, but it is not a, a full-scale transcription or cut and paste of an entire SUD record from a Part 2 program, then it should not uh, necessarily fall under Part 2. However, any Part 2 record that is shared with the uh, non-Part 2 provider would have to uh, remain uh, uh, segregated or segmented, and that would be continued to be protected. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the consent requirements, there's the, the ability now to uh, share information with a, uh, an entity for operations purposes. Uh, the example given in the guidance to the final reg was that in certain cases, uh, patients or clients had wanted to share information with the Social Security Administration uh, when executing the consent, the old Part 2 rule was interpreted to require the identity of the individual within the Social Security Administration uh, to be identified within that consent, which obviously was difficult, if not impossible. This spells out that that is not uh, necessary. It also uh, reaffirms prior uh, rulemaking, which allowed for uh, a general disclosure for health information exchanges and research institutions uh, if they had a treating provider relationship with the individual client or patient. Um, it clarified uh, on the prohibition of redisclosure that there is not a need to uh, redact information uh, if it's not uh, generated by a Part 2 program. So if a non-Part 2 pro, uh, provider puts something in a medical record on its own that relates to an SUD, uh, it would not be necessary for a recipient to redact that or for the provider itself to redact that before sharing it. It's only part two uh, information or records uh, that must be uh, 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 segregated, segmented, or, or redacted. Uh, next slide, please. Um, there is a, an ability under the disclosures with written consent where if a disclosure is made by a part two program to a non-part two provider and well, pursuant to consent, uh, and, and the recipient, um, the lawful holder is the term utilized under part two. If that third party recipient wants to share for payment and healthcare operational purposes, uh, including now care coordination and case management, they may do so uh, with their subcontractors, contractors, and agents. Um, Non-opioid treatment pro uh, providers with a treating provider relationship may access central registries to avoid uh, duplicate or multiple enrollments. Uh, and one of more, the more uh, controversial changes that uh, was implemented, uh, OTPs may now disclose dispensing and prescribing data as required by applicable state law to their state prescription drug monitoring program. However, it still would require patient consent. Uh, so those, those uh, disclosures to the PDMPs 
uh, which in some cases, many cases are either accessible or actually operated by law enforcement, uh, can be carried out. However, the patient must provide uh, the, uh, the consent in order to do so. Uh, there's also a new medical emergency uh, exception that was added uh, in the case where there is some sort of natural or major disaster that is declared by the state or uh, a state or by uh, the federal government, uh, then uh, information may be disclosed uh, to uh, another part two program or other SUD treatment providers uh, with, without uh, consent that would be uh, considered a medical emergency. Next slide, please. Uh, research, uh, there's some changes made there. In the interest of time, I'm going to just skim through that. Another major change that was made was the audit and evaluation uh, exception. So without patient consent, there is now the ability to share information uh, with third-party payers and governmental agencies who are carrying out audits and evaluations, uh, which are now defined to include medical necessity and utilization review activities. Uh, so there is a, a very a broad interpretation of audit and evaluation, uh, which opens up the ability to share that information without patient consent um, for, for those purposes. Finally, uh, the undercover agents and informants, where an undercover agent is going to be placed in a program uh, to see whether the Part 2 program is somehow engaging in illegal conduct. Uh, the period for the court order placement of that agent is now expanded from six months to 12 months, and that uh, time period does not start until the agent or informant is actually placed in the part two program. Uh, next slide. I will turn it over to Dr. Hurley, thank you. Thank you, Judd, for that very detailed information. And now, as you said, I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Hurley for his clinician perspective. Thank you, Dr. Drexler, and thank you, Judd, for the comprehensive presentation. Next slide. So, uh, so I'm Brian Hurley. I am a uh, addiction psychiatrist. I work as the director of addiction medicine for the County Department of Health Services in Los Angeles County, and I'm a proud member of the APA, the American Academy of Addiction Psychiatry, and ASAM, American Society of Addiction Medicine. I'm also on the board of directors of ASAM. I'm going to review three applications of this updated uh, 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 the applicability and redisclosure for non-Part 2 providers to talk about disclosures permitted with written consent for care coordination and case management and talk about opiate treatment programs and um, the uh, updated law around uh, how OTPs now can disclose um, to PPMP is according to um, our now updated regulations. Next slide. So application one, uh, redisclosure for non-Part 2 providers. What the updated regulations say is that uh, treatment records created by non-Part 2 providers based on their own patient encounters are not automatically covered by Part 2. Segregation of a Part 2 patient record previously received can be used to ensure that new records created by non-Part 2 providers will not become subject to Part 2. And this helps facilitate coordination of care between non-2 providers and Part 2, uh, part two providers. And it helps alleviate fear among non-Part 2 providers of inadvertently violating Part 2 as a result of receiving or reading a protected um, substance use disorder patient record and then providing care to that patient. Now you'll notice the term non-Part 2 providers is underlined in the slide. So you might be saying, what does SAMHSA mean by non-2 providers? Well, it means that the providers are not federally assisted substance use disorder treatment programs. So um, a federally assisted program, there's a whole broad set of activities of what it means to be federally assisted, including receiving um, uh, directly or indirectly CMS funding, um, uh, uh, that, your location is registered uh, on a DEA waiver or DEA registration, um, or you know, there's a whole variety of federally assisted activities. And, and most healthcare entities um, are directly or indirectly federally assisted in some definition. But a program and an SUD treatment program, according to SAMHSA, is an individual or entity other than a general medical facility or a unit in a general medical facility that holds itself out 
as providing and provides diagnosis, treatment, or referral for treatment for a substance use disorder. And the medical personnel or staff in a general medical facility who are identified as providers whose primary function is to provide substance use disorder diagnosis, treatment, or referral to substance use uh, disorder treatment are called part two programs for the purposes of the law. So the first application of this revision actually impacts the providers that are not part two providers. Next slide will we'll sort of illustrate how this works. Next slide. So we have a patient, Joe, and uh, he goes to Memorial Addiction Treatment Center and is signed a part two compliant consent form to authorize the Memorial Addiction Treatment Center coordinating care with his primary care doctor. Uh, uh, click forward, please. So uh, Dr. Jones is patient Joe's primary care doctor. Dr. Jones has a discussion with Memorial Addiction Treatment Center about Joe's substance use disorder. Uh, move forward, please. Uh, uh, Dr. Jones for primary care and has a conversation about Joe's substance use disorder treatment. Now document um, the visit with patient Joe informed by the Memorial Addiction Treatment Center's discussion, so informed by collateral information from the part two program and documented in the primary care record without that primary care record itself now being subject to 42 CFR part two. That hadn't been clarified and is Uh, uh, it does provide the information conveyed orally by a part two program to a non-part two provider for treatment purposes uh, does require the consent of the patient. Um, so uh, 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 Memorial Addiction Treatment Center still requires patient Joe to sign the part two compliant consent. And it also clarifies that the recording of information about substance use disorders by a non-two provider does not mean that a medical record is subject to as long as the non-part two provider segregates any actual records received from a part two program um, according to part two compliance, right? So that would mean that if Dr. Jones was to um, receive a physical medical record, that contains its part two protection. But the oral information that was discussed when documented by Dr. Jones in a primary care record is not automatically subject to part two, um, uh, uh, provided that it's not, again, a wholesale transcription of everything that's in the substance use disorder record. And it clarifies that independent record keeping of a non-part two covered entity remains outside the coverage of part two. Um, one clinical implication of this from my vantage point, as I work at a, a number of different um, uh, uh, departments within the public sector in Los Angeles, so one of the departments I work in is our County Department of Mental Health, where I'm a general psychiatrist. And there's been confusion about whether a non-Part 2 entity, in this case, my community mental health clinic, that is not funded or regulated or supported in providing substance use disorder treatment. I'm operating as a general psychiatrist in a community mental health center, and I ask somebody about their substance use disorder. That doesn't mean that documenting substance use disorder information from a non -two, you know, sort of non-Part 2 program is not automatically subject to Part 2 because my role in a mental health center is not as a addiction provider, it's as a general psychiatrist. Uh, next slide. So uh, the second application is disclosures permitting with written consent for care coordination and case management. Um, disclosures for the purposes of quote, payment and healthcare operations are now explicitly listed as permitting or uh, permitted with written consent under regulatory provisions. And this list has been now been expanded to include care coordination and case management. Um, there was a, uh, some discordance or misalignment between, uh, with respect to disclosure of an individual's part two information for the purposes of case management and care coordination. In the past, these, uh, uh, these activities hadn't been included from part two definitions of payment and healthcare operations. So that meant that lawful holders of part two information and their legal representatives, contractors, and subcontractors could not use or disclose patient records with general consent. Now under this August 14th final rule, a lawful holder who receives a substance use disorder record 
subject to the patient's written consent, may further disclose that record to his contractors, subcontractors, or legal representatives, specifically for the purpose, or not exclusively, but in, specifically including the purposes of care court. Um, so this enables it's an, it essentially enables an easier release process because the patient or client can now sign a general consent um, to a part two holder that can disclose with that uh, patient or client's consent um, uh, protected information for the purposes of care coordination and case management to the other you know, contractors or subcontractors, legal representatives uh, where they work. So what does that mean? Next slide. Dr. Hurley, if I could interrupt, we've gotten several Please. comments that your audio, your audio is going in and out. I don't know if that's how you're facing your microphone or if it's internet connection, but if you have any ideas how to remedy I, that, we'd appreciate it. I do, give me about 15 seconds. So I'm now on a different audio channel. Is this helping at all? So far, so good. And all right, if, well, uh, as you proceed, if it doesn't work, I trust you'll let me know. Question. Okay, there's one clarifying question about, is the information you're giving right now about HIPAA consent or specifically about uh, 42 CFR part two? So the information that I've just presented is about disclosures permitted now under 42 CFR Part 2. So it's uh, about the shift um, under Part 2 in substance use disorder tr uh, treatment records. HIPAA is an entirely different framework that has an entirely separate set of rules um, ar around actually a whole number of authorizations of disclosure uh, that's different than these rules. So what I've been talking about is specific to Part 2. All right. So um, uh, as, as I had, and hopefully you caught at least part of this, is um, the implications of this is that patients may consent to disclose part two information to organizations without a treating provider relationship. So um, uh, one implication I can think of specifically is if uh, I have a patient in a part two program and I want to refer them to, uh, uh, let's say, to a, a hospital, but I want to provide records to that hospital, well, I don't know which specific provider the patient's going to see at that facility, but I can consent. Uh, the patient's now allowed to consent to say, okay, uh, you're coordinating care with this hospital. Uh, I now want to consent to uh, uh, release information to I'll give an, an example. Harbor UCLA Medical Center, one of the county-run medical centers in, in Los Angeles, um, uh, I, I now authorize to share information, and then I can, I'm permitted to share information with uh, Harbor UCLA as a partner to my Part 2 program um, uh, with the patient's consent, and they can, uh, uh, I'm now able to do care coordination with a general consent as opposed to needing to identify which specific providers with specific physicians or um, counselors that they might see at that uh, institution or organizations. Patients may consent to share their information with a contractor or subcontractor that performs care coordination or case management, um, and the consent form specifies that the contracted organization name in the to whom section and describes the specific types of activities to be undertaken in the purpose section and meets all other outline requirements, right? So, um, so it is a general consent, but it has to be specific as to what the purpose is in case management and care coordination now uh, is now explicitly included under the updated regulations. Next slide. And then opioid treatment programs. And this, um, I want to, uh, I'm now gonna uh, talk specific to opioid treatment programs. I wanna be explicit that there are opioid treatment programs which are federally licensed uh, um, entities or programs that um, dispense methadone, or buprenorphine to people for the indication of opioid use disorder. And this is separate from office-based opiate treatment programs or OBOTs, um, which are typically providers with X waivers 
that do not work in federally licensed opiate treatment programs that prescribe buprenorphine for the indication of opiate use disorder outside of specialty opiate treatment program settings. So what I'm about to say applies to OTPs specifically. Um, uh, under the revised regulations, Opiate treatment programs are now permitted to enroll in a state prescription drug monitoring program and to report the um, information about the methadone or buprenorphine that they are dispensing to patients into the state's prescription drug monitoring program. Um, consistent with applicable state law. And uh, the reason that this uh, might help is to prevent duplicative enrollments of substance use disorder care, duplicative prescriptions, um, any adverse drug events when uh, uh, a controlled substance the patient might be receiving, such as methadone or buprenorphine from an ODP is not included on a PDMP. This could make the PDM PDMPs more complete. But um, uh, the rules are not simply that OTPs have to, it's simply that OTPs now can enroll in a state PDMP um, if the patient consents to release their information to the state PDMP. So it doesn't eliminate the requirement for patient consent that, that uh, an OTP still has to get the patient to agree to uh, uh, release information to the PDMP. Uh, and state law also has to, uh, 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 the states, it ultimately becomes a sort of, the states get to decide whether they want their own state OTPs to uh, enroll in the state PDMP. So uh, part two is now updated to create a pathway for state PDMPs to receive OTP information if the state laws permit it and if the patient consents to it. Next slide. So before, uh, OTPs essentially did not have a pathway to provide information to PDMPs. Now there's a pathway uh, in accordance with state law and if the, uh, as long as the, the patient consents to the release of that information. Next slide. Um, so I'll uh, turn it back to the, to the group for, for, uh, for questions. All right. Thank you, Dr. Hurley. Um, and thank you to both of our panelists for sharing your insight and expertise. We appreciate you being here today. Um, we'll now move to the question and answer portion of the webinar. If you haven't done so, and many of you have already entered questions into the question and answer box, we may not get to all of these questions, uh, but there have been some unifying themes and I'll try to consolidate those. And any unanswered questions, all of the questions really, we're going to send to SAMHSA, who will review them and put together a frequently asked questions um, that, that folks can refer to going forward. So one common question that we've been receiving, both in the chat and in the Q&A box, there is a difference. Um, if you could use the Q&A box, it helps us to sort them a little bit more effectively. So thank you. Um, but one recurring question is about consent forms. Are there examples of uh, disclosure consent forms that are, comply with the new rule or ones that are drafted for the future with the CARES Act um, that folks can refer to? Uh, this is John, if you'd like me to uh, step in first. Um, there, there are a variety of uh, sort resources and sources. Obviously, your own legal counsel uh, would be a, a great resource. There are organizations that have uh, taken the lead on this. Uh, with respect to uh, the changes under the CARES Act, uh, because those regulations haven't been uh, issued or proposed yet, there wouldn't be anything, uh, in my opinion, that, that uh, would have been uh, drafted to address those changes. Um, with respect to the rule that goes into effect this Friday, um, I have not uh, personally, in, in my change in, in position, I am, am not uh, as deeply involved in the legal uh, field and, and preparing those type, types of documents. Um, but uh, as Dr. Hurley mentioned, and I'll, I'll leave it to him, but my impression is that a lot of these changes are not so much for the part two program uh, and their disclosures that would require consent, but is uh, with respect to the non part two programs. So I'll defer to Dr. Hurley on that. So I'll tell you what we've done in LA County, and um, I, I regret I don't have any like draft form. I mean, I can, I'm happy to share with you some of the forms we use in LA, but I don't have any like um, uh, 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 like example forms. But uh, in 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 LA, I know one of the concerns was 
uh, when we have, so uh, in our county run PCMHs or primary care programs, we have substance use disorder counselors that are identified to identify, treat, and refer patients with substance use disorders. And our substance use disorder counselors, our counselors advice count as a part two program. So and substance use disorder counselors in primary care working with the primary care team. But, um, uh, and we have another constraint that may not be unique to us, but our primary medical record um, interface is not part two compliant. So we have to have our substance use disorder counselors document their counseling in a separate medical record. And it was unclear before if the patient signs a, a, a part two consent um, to coordinate care with the medical team or with, with the practice of whether that was sufficient um, uh, for the purposes of, let's say, a substance use disorder counselor with the patient's consent talks to the, the patient's primary care doctor, and the primary care doctor then documents you know, elements from that conversation was now the primary care doctor's note subject to 42 CFR Part 2, and the answer is now no. Um, that those conversations are permitted with the patient's consent and that the patient can sign a consent um, uh, that, uh, that specifically says, uh, I want you to coordinate care with my primary care physician or my primary care provider, um, and uh, that the records that come from that aren't, uh, aren't subject to, to part two. So, um, uh, so that's been, that's clarified this sort of outstanding sort of legal question um, that our council has sort of not had a clear answer on. Now there's very clear direction on, on what's documentable and what isn't. And so for non-part non -part two programs, it's now clear um, what, uh, what can be documented in a general not part two record that is subject to HIPAA. And, um, and whereas the part two records that are received by a non part two program continue to, you know, they don't lose their part two protection and there has to be a mechanism of those providers to be able to segregate those records and maintain part two compliance. And I don't know that I have a form that describes that, right? I think that, that that's the process. That, that, our, that our organization is now following, um, but I don't have like a standardized form that, that I can share because it, it doesn't necessarily um, change the, the consent paperwork. Um, it just enables what we can do with our existing part two con, uh, compliant consent forms. Thank you, Dr. Hurley. I have another one for you. There's a lot of questions around OTPs. And so if you could please clarify, um, does the patient have to consent for the OTP to check the PDMP? My understanding is OTPs, and I think this is dependent on state law, um, is that if you're a patient or, or a client and an OTP, um, that provider in many states, including my state, is mandated to check um, the, our, our PDMP before initiating a, 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 an order for a controlled substance, in this case, um, uh, an order for dispensing methadone or buprenorphine. So my understanding is it's not only um, is the patient have to consent, I actually think it's required. Um, and uh, uh, it would be good practice to inform the patient of that, right, that, that by, by virtue of enrolling here. Um, but I actually don't know that patients can prevent their OTPs from checking a PDMP. And I should say, I, I should just say, I don't know that, that patients can necessarily, um, because if they're going there for um, Schedule II or Schedule III medication services, many states, and I'm thinking of California, are now requiring um, providers uh, to check the PDMP in order to initiate a prescription or, or an order. Um, uh, but I, I, I should say I don't work in an OTP right now, and so I don't, I don't know exactly if there, there might be exceptions to that. Um, but the big change with for, the, Part 2 didn't change that. Um, what the, the shift with Part 2 was now creating an avenue for OTPs to give information to the PDMP. Um, but in sort of typical practice, uh, OTPs, my impression is, uh, have been, are able to access PDM, PDMP information in accordance with state law, and that hasn't changed under these new regulations. Thank you. And I don't I'm, know, Judd, I'm if gonna, you have anything to add. Yeah, I'm, I'm yeah Judd, <laughs> please. Interest of, uh, it, just one clarification. I agree with Dr. Hurley. I would say, however, though, that if, if an uh, OTP considered a Part 2 program under the, under the regulations uh, were to query identifying itself as a Part 2 program, the OTP, as well as the patient, then that would be likely considered a disclosure. 
uh, which would yeah. not be permissible. So if there's if they're identifying who is accessing the PDMP, which is the OTP, uh, and, and then uh, identifying that that is their patient or client, that would be considered uh, a disclosure, uh, what, what the regs refer to or the guidance refers to as presence in a, in, in a program or presence in a facility or, or presence in treatment or having an SUD. So I think in that case, they would still need patient consent to query uh, the PDMP, to not do, just to do to, the query itself. Yeah. 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 I, think, I think that would be the, the only uh, clarification that I would add to that. Yeah. And, and thank you, Judd. Thank you for rescuing that. <laughs> <laughs> well, and so I, I will maybe muddy the waters a bit, but as an Please. individual provider uh, who has a DEA license and who functions in a healthcare system that required PDMP checks before initiating an order, um, how do I resolve, I, as I inquire, I'm inquiring as an individual provider. So would that violate any disclosure? Uh, I'll, I'll jump in first, just to, to, to uh, trade things up here a bit. Um, I would say that if you are considered uh, a part two program. So if you are an individual that is specializing in SUD treatment, uh, holds yourself out as providing SUD treatment uh, and, and is federally assisted, as you mentioned, uh, then you would be a program. And if just to clarify, I did see a, a question come in. If there is a, 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 a coordination where you can see that an individual is being treated at an OTP, which is a part two program, that is, that is the uh, alignment that would be considered a disclosure under part two. So if you are querying the PDMP and the PDMP has a record and indication that that OTP queried on behalf of an individual, that would tie those, those two parties together, thus indicating that that individual has an SUD or likely has an SUD, and that would be the part two disclosure that would be prohibited without patient consent. And so in, where in I work. states may, may vary, but I don't think that that's an issue. I think when I go to my state PDMP, I'm going as an individual provider. And I can do I was, queries when I'm considering starting a medication. It doesn't imply that I'm treating any Substance yeah, we're, we're, we're talking about different things. If you, if you yeah. yourself are considered a part two program, an, an individual can be a part two program. As Dr. Hurley mentioned, he has an interdisciplinary team where certain providers are considered a part two program and other providers are not. You can divide it up and dice it up in, in that, in that uh, uh, granular level, uh, what is and is not a part two program, correct? I, I agree with you, Karen. Uh, same thing in California. When I'm querying the PDMP, I'm doing so as an individual license, you know, as an individual with a DA registration, not as a uh, as a program. Um, is is I think true for most. I, I don't know in every use case, but that's true for most of the um, providers that I know that work in California. Okay. Great. And that, unfortunately, that lively discussion was all we time. time for. Um, and there were so many more terrific questions around uh, uh, COVID pandemic related. Um, so as I mentioned at the beginning of this Q&A section, we anticipated that we wouldn't have time to get to all your wonderful questions. We will forward them to SAMHSA. And SAMHSA has told us that they would love to receive these so they can incorporate them into a frequently asked questions document that will be available publicly. And with that, I'll pause to see if our, um, if Nate or Michelle have any other remarks before we close. All right, thank you again to all of you for participating in today's webinar. As a reminder, the event was recorded and that recording as well as the presenter's slides and an evaluation will be posted on all the three organizations' websites. Information about the rule can also be found by visiting samsha.gov and the websites are listed here on this last slide. Thank you again and thanks for all that you are doing.